Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the National Gallery Singapore. Um, thank you for coming down on a Friday evening. I know it's just before the long weekend, and it's also before um, before Hari Raya Haji. So thank you again for making effort and also like dressing up to come down. Um, since today is going to be kind of small and cozy, I, I'm just wondering if you would like to like kind of get her a bit closer. It's like Friday evening, and then like we can have like a more easy and casual chat uh, with regards to uh, the talk that will happen. But if not, it's fine as well because like I know everybody have boundaries, and it's just like you know just take it easy. Um, my name is Chini. I'm the curator of the seventh iteration of the Ng Ting Fong Roof Garden Commission. And with me tonight, I'm very honored and privileged to actually be talking to uh, Lisa Rahana, the artist um, who has been commissioned to do Glisten um, on the Ng Ting Fong Roof Garden Commission. Now, in this talk, we will be exploring the breath and the duff of uh, Lisa's practice. This is the first time that she's doing a solo presentation in Singapore and as well in Southeast Asia. For her, Lisa's practice delves into this, um, delves into looking, evoking visibility of like Maori culture, genders, and Pacific Islander culture um, on, in true contemporary art. At the same time, it is true contemporary art and contemporary new designs and technology that she sees that evokes, comes to terms of ancestral knowledge, knowledges that we uh, consider indigenous knowledges, but reinterpreted into contemporary mediums. Now for tonight, um, other than talking about Glisten, we will also look at, in part, to some of her presentation, um, particularly her work in the Venice Biennale in 2017, where she was the first Maori artist to represent New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I'm, we'll probably have a presentation by Lisa for 40 minutes, followed by a very loose Q&A and a conversation between both of us. And feel free to let us know if you have any questions at any one point of time. So without further ado, Lisa. Kia ora koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui, kia koutou. Um, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you here this evening. Um, it was, uh, it's such an honour to be able to create a large-scale sculpture that I know is now going to be on show here in Singapore for the next nine months. Um, my partner James is here, we've been here for two weeks and we go home on Sunday. So I leave it in the capable hands of Chin Yi Lim, thank you so much for working alongside me. We've been talking about this commission for six to seven months now. So um, I thought, well, I was uh, requested to talk a little bit about some of the other projects that I've done, which I hope bring a little bit of focus to the, um, the work Glisten that is on show here. Um, and so I'll just jump into it. If there's any words or I'm not making sense or you can't hear me, just please shout out. There's a nice, small uh, but intimate audience this evening. So I too thank you for giving up your Friday evening to hear me chat. Um, so uh, let me just start off with a project called In Pursuit of Venus, Infected. Uh, it's a great title. People kept saying to me, why'd you put infected in there? And uh, it's really about knowledge, I suppose. Once you've heard something or somebody's told you something, you can't unknow it. And so this particular work um, has some quite, it's a big work. I spent 10 years um, on and off working on this project. By and large, seven years just um, bringing it to fruition for when I presented it at the Venice Biennale in 2017. And I have some words which I, I thought I'd just read. I don't usually read them, but I think it kind of tries to encapsulate some of the ideas that are embedded in this work. So um, this image here is from when I first presented the work in my own hometown of Auckland, New Zealand. 
And uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, um, so there's a few people sitting in front of a screen. The screen itself is 24 metres long and it's four metres high. Um, so it would probably be about the size of this room right across here, just to give you a sense of the scale of the video. In neoclassical France, entrepreneur Joseph Dufour used the latest printing innovations to produce Les Sauvages de la Mer Pacifique, which was produced in 1804. It was a sophisticated 20 scenic wallpaper. Its exotic subject matter referenced the popular illustrations of the times and mirrored the fascination with the Pacific voyages undertaken by Captain Cook, Louis de Bougainville, and de la Perouse. Two hundred years later, the Maori artist Lisa Rehana, that's me, employs 21st century digital technologies to animate Les Sauvages de la, Mar de la Mar Pacific wallpaper, enlivened with the sights and sounds of dance and cultural ceremonies, the vast panorama is populated by a myriad of people drawn from across the Pacific, New Zealand and Australia. Different notions of ownership and reciprocity resulted in misunderstandings and violent outbursts to challenge the stereotypes that developed in those times and since. The gaze of imperialism is returned with a speculative twist that disrupts notions of beauty, authenticity, history and myth. Captain Cook, his cohorts, and an array of costume characters reenact narratives to remind us that history is a construction. Now this particular slide here was taken uh, from, uh, I was doing an artist in residency in America, in Montalvo Art Center, and it was a wonderful time for me. It gave me um, three months to sit in a studio. I was um, looking at the illustrations that there's thousands of them were generated around the 1700s and early 1800s. And what it's showing you is some of the visual material that I was looking at when I was thinking about making this large video project. So on the walls of the studio and the center panel, you can see images of Captain Cook. I was also looking at his, um, his regalia, his special attire that he would wear after he'd come off the boat the types of um, indigenous peoples that he was meeting along this journey. Um, he went up to Nootka Sound in Vancouver and uh, he was looking for the Northwest Coast Passage. So he was under orders from uh, the British Navy to initially record the transit of Venus and the reason people were looking for the transit of Venus was to create these um, uh, trade routes. Um, interestingly, last night in Vancouver, uh, In Pursuit of Venus opened. Um, so it's the 36th time that it's been traveling around the world and showing in different galleries. And for me, it's a really important opportunity. I'll be going up there in September to see the presentation of the work and do an artist talk there. Um, but for me, also uh, working on a project to rethink the ways that Pacific people have been presented, but making it an international work was it the inclusion of uh, the people from Canada and also people from Australia. On the right-hand side of this, of this slide, you'll see, I'm, I mean, I was really looking at this kind of visual material and some of those characters because uh, my project was 
to delve deeply into a very well-known history, well-known mostly from an anthropological and a historical perspective, but to be an artist and think about the artists who travelled alongside Captain Cook and think about how they interacted with some of the um, local indigenous people that they found along the way. I'm really inspired by the artists who were on board uh, these travels of uh, Captain Cook. And because he had artists on board, uh, it was one of the reasons why he became so famous. There was this visual material, this, um, the world suddenly became, they became armchair tourists because there was this imagery that was circulating around the world. Uh, this is an image of uh, when we were recording some of the scenes for the final work. Um, I used a, a, a tried and true technology, which is where you record in green screen. Um, you see it when people are presenting the news. They'll be standing in front of green screen, but the um, illustrations are replaced behind them. And I use this technique as a way for me to be able to accrue uh, scenes and stories along the way over a series of, I think I did about six or seven short bursts of filming with different people. I would make money, <laughs> have lots of exhibitions, save up money, and then sort of have these little bursts of time so I could afford to bring more and more people into the project. Um, and I'll just flick back. I really like this image here. This was a, a photo, it's a detail, it's a photograph of me taking a photograph of the wallpaper on a very early iPhone. I think this might be an iPhone 4. But I love the aspects of showing on, on that little screen. I'd done this little test run to see if I could create this wallpaper as a video wallpaper and that's um, these two you know, 200 years between these two different types of art practice sitting together. This is, um, this project allowed me to go into the back rooms of different museums around the world. Uh, because Captain Cook was so famous, and there was also Joseph Banks was also on the crew, he was busy collecting lots of material, culture, illustrations, um, flora and fauna to take back to England and it was a way of lifting himself up and, and being able to, uh, he ended up uh, being the director of the Royal Society, uh, Royal Geographic Society. He, um, Joseph Banks was a botanist, a linguist, and a great raconteur. Uh, when I thought about him, he was probably a bit like, um, who was the man that ran Virgin Airlines initially? Richard Branson. Yeah, Branson. So I, mean, th I think of him as like the Branson of, of his era. You know, he, he, he was, you know, larger than life character, really interested in, you know, traveling the world, taking up every technology that he could get his hands on. Um, so during uh, the second voyage, this particular chief mourner's um, headdress or this mask was collected and this is in the collection of the Cambridge Museum. One of the reasons I was particularly interested in this um, beautiful treasure is because Captain Cook was so great at um, travelling around the Pacific because they collected people along the way one of which was a famous Tahitian um, chief, um, Arioi, a very well, um, well uh, his knowledge uh, was huge. He made this drawing, this little drawing that sits on the right hand side. And I like this drawing, it's by Tupaya. It was only proved about 50 years ago that he made this drawing. Um, but it, to me, it's, it's the first example of a Pacific person taking on European illustration techniques. And it's something that I come back to again and again, thinking about where is the artistry um, and how to use this project in pursuit of Venus to foreground those kind of ideas. 
I'm just going to play you a little excerpt from the project itself. This is not the entirety of the work. I think we might bounce in and out of it, but it'll give you a sense of these um, series of vignettes or scenes. There was um, about 72 different scenes that I made for the project. particular um, sequence is towards the latter part of the 64 minute loop um, but I thought it was really uh, important to show the death of Cook uh, and then think about what that meant for other cultures at that time. Uh, there's a Hawaiian uh, beautiful uh, I suppose you call it uli uli and it's the women and the chanting. And I just think because these Hawaiian people are here, it's really nice to point out to everybody that right now in Hawaii is um, Fest Pack. And every four years, it is this major uh, gathering of Pacific peoples, uh, Taiwanese as part of the Austronesian connection. And that just opened this week. and. It was generated, started back in the 1960s, I think, uh, and every four years a different Pacific nation hosts it. And it is one of these places where we are able to come together and share in each other's culture, see the um, art practices, the dance, theatre. Um, and so when I did some of my recording, uh, we have um, Pacifica Festival in, in Auckland, New Zealand. And it was at that time I did one of my um, video productions so that I could work with some Hawaiian people. And uh, that was with a group that came in and helped me uh, record this particular scene. And it was really important for me to be able to bring local people in and ask them how they might want to have a response to some of the storytelling and this idea of Captain Cook being in the project. Um, so that's just a little bit. I could talk about this project on its own for a whole hour in itself because it's, um, it has a lot of um, detail in it. 
Um, I will just point out on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a group of Maori men. They're about to perform a haka. And what I did in this particular work was show them from behind. And it was a, a very important positioning because instead of uh, seeing them from the front, almost like you're being um, entertained, the idea is that you're sitting behind them and they are representing you. So in Pursuit of Venus, um, we had a short form version of it, IPOV or POV. POV is a... Uh, um, is short for point of view within film film terminology. So I'm really trying to play with people's perceptions of where they are on, in history and where how they position themselves according to these kind of colonial histories. The next work I wanted to just quickly um, show you is a work called uh, from a larger installation called Mai I Te Aroha. Kote Aroha, which in, is a Māori um, for, from love comes love. Uh, and many of the titles and the works that I do, I try and embody love into the title because I think there's so many wars and so much uh, terrible things happening in the world that it's just one thing that I am able to... Um, uh, point out or uh, embody in the projects I do. This particular work um, uses, I don't know, a few thousand different handmade beads or hand cast beads. Um, they're a tetradecahedron and they're based on tanical patterns. Um, but this particular work is about a pew pew um, and it was designed by a very famous uh, weaver called Rangamari Ahitet. And it is the first thing that you walk underneath when you walk through this very long um, hallway. Um, Te Arahini is the name of this entrance. It's the female entrance that takes you up to a marae in Te Papa uh, Museum, the, our national museum in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, the idea of this work, this gives you a sense, it's kind of 52 metres long, so it's a long lens that, to show you how far this work, these series of works um, take place. But it's the idea of walking underneath the skirt of a woman. I know, it's a bit scandalous. But the idea of that is that it, um, it's a protection or it's something that men would do after coming back from war. And it's a kind of cleansing idea because all, all people, male and female, are born from between the legs of a woman. So it's about, it's a generative thing and it's a healing thing and it's a safety aspect as well. Um, so what I wanted to do was to symbolically show that idea. So this pattern of the pew pew hangs quite high up. Um, the image on the left-hand side shows, I think there's about 11 metres high. It's very tall, um, this particular space that it was in. And the idea is that it means that anyone that walks through that hallway is kind of spiritually cleansed as they're making their way towards uh, the, um, the Farinui upstairs. Um, and I wanted to show this work particularly because... Um, Oops, pushing the wrong button. To me, it's sort of... This and the next work are probably the closest aligned to Glisten. So um, I wanted to show you, this is what a pew pew looks like. Um, they have these beautiful patterns on them, and they're made from harakeke, or flax, the flax plant. Uh, skilled weavers make these. They take a lot of work. There's hundreds of strands of the flax plant. They naturally curl inwards. And they're really beautiful uh, when, because when we dance in them, they have this, uh, a slight sound to them. Uh, Carl Leonard, we're hoping that he might come back. There's going to be a conference at March at the end of the program of Glisten being on show. And he is what we'd call a master weaver. 
this is one of his works that he gifted uh, on one of his travels. And you can tell that this is a very special pew pew or dance skirt because it features a tanical band at the top of it. And on that band, there's a combination of black, white, and the tanikaha yellow, which I've also included in my installation, Glisten. Um, you can see alongside on that table is uh, an example of mocha fiber or an, a native fiber in this tanikaha yellow, which is absolutely beautiful and um, really uh, a highly skilled craftsman uh, makes these works. Oh, backwards and forwards. And then this, just to give you a sense of, this is from Kapahaka, we use these in our um, performing dance process and that gives you an idea of the skirts spinning and there will be a number of dancers and when you get a whole bunch of people dancing together, it also has a kind of percussive aspect to it. So that leads me, after I made the work, uh, Mai Te Aroha, Ko Te Aroha, I wanted to develop this idea even further and look at Taniko as a, um, as kind of exploded and created into a 3D interpretation. This was from a commission, it's an entrance into uh, a theatre space. Again, really important, the uh, positioning of Rangamarie Last Dance is underneath as you enter into the theatre. So this notion of going through hallways um, or doorways or kuaha is really important because it's this idea of moving from one realm into another. Um, and by walking underneath this particular work, Again, you're being um, cleansed and being readied from going from the outside world and then going into the dark space of a theatre space. These are to give you a sense of some of the more traditional Maori um, artworks, what they look like, our carving pieces. They're beautiful, highly decorated, we will call them master carvers who would undertake the making of these pari or lintels. And then you can see the two women standing underneath uh, the pari in the um, Whaninui or a meeting house on that right hand side uh, slide. And when, as a woman, when you stand in that space, it's a really safe space for you to be in, in the hallway, under the doorway, sorry. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, the one on the left is the lintel that um, is in the uh, Parliament of New Zealand House in Wellington. But So that's just to really give you a sense of the difference of a, a more traditional lintel or party and the type of work that I've done. So as a digital artist, I do a lot of work um, on computers and... Um, and making video projects. This was the first time when I got to work with uh, a young, a younger um, Indian 3D artist, and I said, I really want to take a tarnical pattern and kind of explode it out. And I needed to do that so that I could count how many rows I might need to make, how many beads that I'd have to count up each row and order them, and, and just the kind of logistics of creating artworks. So this, um, I've never actually shown this slide before, <laughs> um, but I came across it and I thought it might be quite interesting for you to be able to see um, just that process of how artists might suddenly think about what is the idea and how do you go about creating it. But what I'll also talk to you, I'll, I'll read um, my, uh, some, from my proposal and why the work looks as it does. So, Rangi Marie's Last Dance. The title is really derived from the story that I'm seeking to represent through these 11,000 beads. Rangi Marie was a renowned mid 17th century choreographer from the Auckland region of New Zealand. 
Both of her parents descended from senior lines of their tribal groups. This work is based on a historical event that took place on Mangakia Kia Kia, One Tree Hill, which is in the center of Auckland. While making final preparations for her wedding, Rangi Marie became aware of the host's intention to ambush and kill her and her kinfolk. Dancing solo that night when the tribes had come together just before the wedding preparations were taking part, Rangi Marie informed her family through her dance gestures and movements, thus raising the alarm and saving many, many thousands of lives. Rangi Marie and her family escaped and hid in a cave in Epsom for two weeks before being rescued by her people from Kaipara. So in this particular work, and down the bottom, the white, um, the white series of beads, they pick out um, Niho Tanifa, which is a dragon's teeth pattern. And this is a particular um, dance or a stance movement that you see in choreography, but is also employed in war movements. It's a pincer movement. So I chose that particular design because I thought it may have been something that she might have done uh, um, embodied in her dance. So that just gives you another close-up of these um, these. Uh, patterns. The central part of the work, the red, that's Rangi Marie. I wanted to dep depict her red being such a strong and chiefly colour. And then the two black pyramids either side of her are the, the two different tribes, the tribal lines that she comes from. And then also the red beads become these um, almost woven, her links back to her different people. And then the white is a series of the serpent's teeth or neho tanifa. And so that gives you a sense of what the final work looked like. Um, it was an interesting, it looked, you can see more of the lines of this work. And um, so there was 11,000 beads in the final work, and I think I used about five miles or six miles of um, fishing line to create the strands that the work sits on. And at the top of the work, it was a um, mirrored perspex. So when you stand underneath it, it has this effect, uh, effect of they're not just pyramids, then they become diamonds. So there's this kind of three-dimensional aspect um, of, the, of the work. And, and so for me, coming back to make this work glisten was really thinking about this idea of pixels and numbers and logistics as well. So, to glisten, um, it's, it's such uh, an honour to come and work here in Singapore and as an Indigenous woman, a person of colour, um, I didn't want to just bring something from home and impose just a, a materiality and aesthetic and storytelling of just my, of Aotearoa New Zealand. I wanted to find something that made a connection. That's something always important um, to, well, it's, it's, to me it's an aspect of our uh, Maori culture um, and the ways that we are in the world. So uh, I've always been inspired by uh, weaving patterns, um, but as a kind of a chick born in the 60s, you know, somebody that kind of taken up um, digital media and, and thinking about how can I use that as a new medium to keep looking at our traditions and pushing it forward, you know, to inspire next generations and remind them of where we come from and the sorts of... Um, materials that we might want to use. Um, Song Ket, uh, so beautiful, a textile. I was sort of thinking about when I got invited to, to do this commission, I started to look around and think about what, what can I bring? What, what would be 
uh, a really nice learning opportunity for myself, um, and and that's when I kind of struck a, a, across Songket. And the reason that this work is kind of glistening and bright and it uses um, almost like sequined technology is inspired by the technique of the master songket weavers and how they employ gold or silver threads and do a supplementary pattern on top of the, the base fabric. And so that became the inspiration for this particular project. And we have a beautiful example here in the room. Um, so uh, Chin Yi and I started to talk about this once I'd been uh, gifted, you know, uh, chosen to do this commission. There was this really lovely opportunity to then try and um, come to terms with, oh my goodness, here I am. I don't want to be seen to be appropriating somebody else's um, art, art practice because I know there are master weavers um, in Malaysia. Equally, um, being able to have such, um, you know, such an amazing presentation space, here, here is an opportunity to really showcase this particular work and hopefully more and more people will be able to talk about it and there'll be more conversations about um, Songket. So I start with this slide particularly because um, you know, it is, it is the glisten. We might want to turn that down. <laughs> so these are just a few little um, videos that we've made since we've been here. Um, but I did want to have Taniko, which is something that I'm very, um, I, I feel much more versed in our techniques. But I did want to, to me, my, my question to myself is, what might it look like if we have song kit patterns presented alongside tinical patterns? You know, for me, it's trying to create a handshake. There's a very sharp angle in the work. This is Chin Yi's photograph, by the way. <laughs> On the nights when we've been testing out um, the particular um, work. Um, so here, here are some images, some very historical images that I've nabbed off the internet uh, to show you how people created these kind of tanical patterns in the days of old. Um, sometimes people would use pegs to hold them up and sometimes they use um, in a finger weaving style. Interestingly, uh, these particular we weavings done in the old days, a lot of these are from the Tuhoi area, uh, they would start with the tarniko and, and then begin the weaving of the cloak. Uh, other people will weave the cloak first and then do the tarniko border afterwards because they're quite different types of techniques. Here's some close-up ideas of, you know, just to see how uh, the work is undertaken. They're absolutely beautiful. I mean, I could just stare at these patterns for days and days. Uh, and I think when you start to look at weaving patterns and they're on these grid systems, it seemed to me that there was an opportunity to um, present some Maori um, uh, artistry from Aotearoa and then present that alongside the songket as well. Uh, these are just a couple of images. My sister has taken up um, weaving and um, she did that she, she was learning the craft of cloak making, which is, it's almost like the, the highest and hardest and, the, and it's the pinnacle of weaving is to be, begin to make your own korowai or cloaks. And that was when my father became unwell and so for many, many years she was practicing so that she could make this um, as, as her gift, her parting gift for my father. Um, since then, she's been weaving many, many cloaks, and I think um, I turned 60 at the end of this year, and I think that's probably when she's going to give me one, because <laughs> she's <laughs> given everyone else one. And it, it is really, um, I think it's the joy of a weaver, is that fact that you can make these beautiful things and you adorn the people that you love. Um, they are used on very ceremonial occasions. Um, and these ones are really cute and little. She's made them for all her um, grandchildren. So there's a number of them circulating. 
uh, amidst our family nowadays. And if there's any special events, um, we will, you know, talk to her and wear them. So there's that joy of wearing something from your own family and, and um, so I, I just wanted to include these images of Shree's work. Um, this is an image here. Uh, I wanted to contrast to uh, something very historic with a beautiful uh, weaving pattern that you will actually see in Glisten. And the one on the right hand side is an image, a, a portrait that I've taken of my sister's eldest daughter, Kitty Emma. And she's wearing a cloak or a kōrawai made by Rangamari Ahitech, one of our preeminent uh, weavers. So I, here again, I, I photographed uh, my sister's um, daughters, almost as a reference to me and my sisters. They've, there's four girls in my family, and there's four, four girls in the next generation. So I, I called them Nā Hau Efa, the four winds. The four wind goddesses, so they're like compass points to me. And actually, um, when I photograph them, I, they all have um, almost east, west, east, west, north and south qualities to them. So uh, that's an image that I took, I think, in about 2011. The song kit. Uh, well, look, what can I say? There's more people here have much more uh, knowledge about the, the textiles of this region, uh, but I was just gobsmacked when I started to... I mean, you know, my research, it's a cheap way to do it. You start on Google and see where you end up, you know. That's, um, but it's more and more, it's a great way of being able to, to have a deep dive. And then also with Chin Yi, we were talking about Grace. What's Grace? Uh, Grace Abenagam, the Malaysian artist, published her thesis on Songkit in 1990. And this, uh, Grace Abenagam was a member of the Wednesday Art Group in Malaysia, and she did a lot of Batik paintings. But by 1990, in the 80s and the 90s, she pursued a master's degree under the University of Science of Malaysia. Um, and did a full research on the Malay Peninsula on Songket. So if you are by the NLB reference library, have a check out because I think there's currently two copies left of that book. Yeah, I tried to buy some books and they were extraordinarily expensive. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the computer really does become your friend in these instances. But yeah, so I mean, I, I was collecting many, many, um, as much as I could over this last past sort of, particularly two months when I was really thinking about the patterns and designs that I would want to appear in Glisten. Um, but looking at the skill of the weavers and these two, um, these two works at the bottom are actually from the Te Papa collection, which is in Wellington. I didn't get to see them um, with my own eyes, but there was, I mean, I was just constantly, um, like that first image that I shown, sometimes just having photocopies and images around you so you can almost have a sense of being able to absorb somebody else's, not absorb the culture, but just become more familiar with it. So, um, oh, and then, of course, I couldn't help but put Saloma in there because I loved the fact that, you know, that sometimes uh, you have these kind of, you start looking, there's more historical imagery, and then you're looking around who's, who are those people who are sort of um, showcasing and, and bringing that, those, these um, beautiful textiles and, and keeping them in people's consciousness. So I was um, really delighted when I came across Saloma because I thought, oh, she's, she's a bit of a star. Um, and that brings me to, this was my initial uh, pitch imagery for making the work, which is now um, up on, uh, on the rooftop garden. And it really is quite different to where we ended up. Um, but, and uh, for me, it's the, the work is quite a large sculptural piece. It has a, it's a, what you call an isosceles triangle, which means it's got a very sharp, one of the corners is very sharp. And when you stand in front of that corner, it does uh, 
my partner James and I were commenting how it's like a boat or a walker, and um, they're very feature very prominently um, in our culture because the, that is how we have uh, populated the Pacific. It's how we get to see each other, and the walker is like the the place that holds a community. Um, so yeah, my idea is to have one, one long wall has the tanico on one side, one long wall has the song catch, and the short wall for me is like the handshake and that's where they come together. So uh, that, I think, is really uh, gives you a sense of what I wanted to do for Glisten. And I don't know how our time is. Do we have time to show a little yes. clip? Um, I just wanted to give you a sneak peek preview. Next week I'm opening a new work um, at, as a commission for Auckland University, which is the university that I attended. And um, for that I was looking at the structure of the marae, um, and I've been working a lot with, um, I'll just get it playing actually, so I can just chat while we're on it. So I um, wanted to look at this idea of using the natural world and creating patterns from them. So that's very much what's happening in Glisten. Uh, the song kept patterns often are from flora and fauna. The weavers are um, reacting to the, the imagery and what's around them. Um, this particular work is, um, is wraps around a, a three-walled LED screen. So you can see um, perhaps just here that actually folds back and around. So mostly, if you're right in front of this um, video work, you might just see the performer. Um, so it was a, uh, this work is called Maramatanga, which um, is a reference to knowledge. Uh, and that, for me, I, I'm working with a group of uh, the performing arts students, the dancers. And so it was, it's really lovely, they're about to feature where they're, um, they're studying. Uh, but this, this project is me thinking about when I was at university, they built uh, a marae. And that's a, a Maori meeting house. And that was a really important moment. It sort of really shifted uh, a university into reckoning with the culture on the land that it sits and the diversity of the students. Uh, this, work, this particular scene here, I'm working with a young woman called Chaz Mamia, and when I asked her if she wanted to embody an ancestor, she was talking about Hini Amaru, and Hini Amaru uh, is a, a female leader, and she uh, was the leader that moved a whole hundreds of her people and set up an, a, a new community and a new area. Um, and I'm also um, related to Nati Hini, so this is uh, a, a, a female chief chieftainess uh, from about the 1600s was when she went on this walk. So um, I've got her this idea of arriving, and um, I thought it was a really beautiful way of thinking about walking uh, through the land and arriving in a place. There are other uh, dancers because uh, the meeting house that's on uh, Auckland University grounds has a lot of navigators embodied in it. And I liked that it had navigators because that navigation meant that it's bringing many, many people. There's an opportunity to have this sense of diversity. So uh, there's a number of different uh, people embodied in the work. We have uh, Chinese, Samoan, Maori, Tongan, Nuean um, performers. Um, and then some of them are representing different creation stories um, and different ancestors um, within the work. So I just wanted to share this with you to give you a sense of 
playing with patterns, thinking about how they start to talk to this notion of weaving. Um, when I first started becoming, you know, practicing uh, being a, a video artist, I used to think of the recording material as the gathering of materials, as a, as a weaver might do. And the editing is putting it all together and creating the patterns. So this is just another way of, um, you know, it's a way of feminizing uh, technology. So it was a good way for me to be able to not be scared and just grab this um, technology by the horns and play with it. So that's me coming to the end of my talk. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, so Lisa, so sort of bring back to Glisten itself, we have had many conversations. I think I, I, think I, I, I see some of the questions that I saw in your studio like in April before, <laughs> in the video there. So we are thinking about systems of knowledge production, uh, systems of language, systems that come with knowledge constructions during the Western Enlightenment, like, you know, genders, uh, craft and art, legends, leaders, and modernities. In this case, um, I think one of the things to highlight is about talking about that decision of yours um, to title GLSEN um, in all capital, uh, capitalized. And I was just wondering if you could Tell us a bit more about that decision of why you wanted to intervene or, or, or create this disruption. Sure. Um, it was really to annoy museum makers <laughs> because when you, pr um, when you print labels on the wall, there's a convention that um, museums like to play with and they'll have an uppercase first letter and then le little letters after that. So, putting uppercase letters is really pushing against museum conventions. Using, um, you know, like nowadays with emojis and, and all the, the QWERTY keys that we can play with, it really annoys um, the conventions of art galleries and museums. And um, that's just something that I like to do because it, it it's kind of comes from a European perspective, uh, very much an American, like if you're doing a thesis, there's really particular ways that you have to recognize other people's writing, etc. So it's one way that I can be a little bit annoying. Um, Jenny and I talked about this quite a lot. <laughs> it's like, but you realize I want to write it differently and I go, yes, so that's okay. So That's um, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, another aspect of the word glisten, uh, uh, it really talks to the beauty and the nature of Songket textiles, but also in the area that I live in Auckland, there's a, um, a number of beautiful Maori names that have been lost post-colonization, and they're starting to come back into use again. Um, a local area where we live is Waiatolo, and there's another area called Waikokota, and they talk to uh, the water that used to, um, the way that the light glistens and bounces off the water. And it's really those kind of indigenous knowledge, you know, that we might have, you know, you'll go up to Alaska and they'll say, we have 67 names for wind because there's 67 different types of wind, you know. So there's not just wind, which we get in in uh, English um, English speaking language. It's like there's so much more um, delicacy and nuance. So I, I liked that uh, Waikokota is one of the. It's it's um, smooth like obsidian, and obsidian is. Um, black volcanic glass or rock and obsidian is a really interesting stone because it's one of those few stones that's made from fire and water so it's a volcanic stone and stones are really important and I think you get that kind of quality in glisten it's got this black base um, most of it's black and that was 
particularly I chose it because uh, black is an important colour for Māori. It's, um, we, it's where we come from. It's almost a reference to the Big Bang theory. But it's also, you can't see light without darkness. So, and it's also, um, to see the light is re um, it's, it's um, recognising the coming of knowledge. So um, glisten has that kind of quality, even though it's black, when the sun or light hits it, it's actually white as well. So it has this kind of lightness about it, which I, I think about the way that light bounces off some of the water that surrounds our islands. Yeah, speaking of light, there's also this idea, this effect of the shimmer that goes across. Now, for Glisten itself, we spoke about it as a kinetic sculpture that is responsive to the environment. And I, I, and I know in our conversations, they were like talking about the qualities of air that you talk that ripples through the sculpture that we see across the surface. And can you tell us more about like this whole um, knowledge that you have, like how it governed the whole shaping of Glisten in terms of an isosceles triangle and the use of the, this particular, the choice of this particular material. That well, it's really, it's kind of a mesmerizing material, the shimmer discs. They, it's quite lovely. I think what it does is it does evoke an organic quality back into that space. When you're in the, you know, at the top and looking around, there's a lot of uh, buildings. It's lovely. We've got the, the green, you know, it's got the green walls. But I thought that was another way of being able to see the wind. Sometimes it's not very windy up there, uh, and sometimes it's really windy. We've watched it, and it's, it has that quality of almost seeing wind pass over long blades of grass. Uh, the other aspect of the wind, or the natural elements, is um, we made a wind chime to put up there as well. I mean, I'm, I'm by and large a media-based artist, so I wanted to have audio-visual, and um, there's also a seat so people can rest spend some time, um, but the wind chimes is also an oral way of understanding what's naturally happening on the garden when you're in that space, when you're up there. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, I, I have had a few questions with regards to shimmedis. Like, how did you first encounter this as a material? Um, it's, it's actually an industrial material and it's used a lot in um, signage and billboards and um, many, many years ago uh, my girlfriend was opening up a cafe uh, called Verona and they, they used the shimmer disc and the, and the shimmer disc is still hanging there almost 25 years later and it's like, it's used to go come here, come on, <laughs> look at me um, and I always thought it was a, you know, it's kind of I know it's kind of charming and fun material, but I never had a reason particularly to use it. I really felt like the song kit was the, the, it was the key that unlocked the making of this work, in fact. Um, there are, you know, there's a number of uh, similar uh, materials around the world. If you start to look into them, there's a number of artists working um, with similar materials, but I, I like it too because for me, um, I work with, when you're making videos, the first thing I have to work out is what they call pixels. And I'm working out the, the format of a project, whether it's 4K, 2K, 15K. So I'm actually counting pixels all the time. And, you know, for me, it really does look like a loom when I was thinking about it. It's, it's, it wasn't hard for me to imagine. I've never worked with this material, by the way. This is my first time of making a, a large sculpture like this. But I could imagine in my head that it, how it might move but that it also really does um, sit within my media practice in a way. Um, we thought it kind of looks like a GIF. <laughs> each, each side, you can look at stand in front of each side and sort of almost see it, it's like this kind of moving GIF. So to me, it has that kind of quality. I chose square pixels because uh, a video and in Photoshop, these you know, uh, computer programs, we work with square pixels. So that was my very, it wasn't, they're not round pixels, they're square pixels. So that's very much a reference to um, my practice as a, as a media artist. 
Yeah. So, I mean, like, just to sort of round back up, you know, this whole using of contemporary materials, meeting, say, like, traditions, like, from ancestor knowledge. And again, like, this ancestor knowledge guiding your awareness of the environment. Like, how do you see this? How can we cultivate more of this awareness moving forward? Because the sensitivity requires a lived experience that you have gone through you know, from the 70s to the 80s in New Zealand itself? Well, my hope is um, for people who visit the work, um, just seeing the patterns might make you want to research a little bit further into the cultures and where they come from. Uh, I think, I imagine there's going to be lots of Instagram posts which will create a link for other people to be, become made aware of the work. Um, I mean, I can, as an artist, in a way, making things, when you finish something, I mean, I have a lot of research that I'll do to work out logistically, um, culturally, philosophically, how to create a work. Uh, but then it's really a proposition that sits in the world. It becomes an artifact for other people to encounter. And then hopefully it, it inspires some further looking, making, thinking. Um, and that's really, um, it's my hope. I mean, it really worries me what's happening uh, for the world ecologically. It's, you know, it's a big concern. So that visualisation of the wind and hearing those sounds, it, it's evocative of nature, but it's really, um, it's a super nature, really. It's not natural at all. Um, but really, for me, it's the cultural aspects of the textile that I'm hoping people pick up on. So I think like we're going to open out to the floor for any questions with regards to Lisa's practice, listen, and the contents of the talk. So if you have a question, please don't be shy. <laughs> it's Friday evening after all. <laughs> any questions? How many um, um There's 114,000. 114,000. That's, uh, for me, that's not so many. <laughs> because um, in pursuit of Venus, that's a 15K project, and that has um, 15 million pixels in it. So... Um, uh, for each year, well, yeah, I had to count them all up, and it was quite a thing. Uh, it's a sort of a slightly different way of working, but it's really good. I've made some quite large video works, which uh, we had quite a short um, delivery time on making this work, and I thought, I can do it. It's not so hard. <laughs> you know, I just kind of gird myself and think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lady over there. Thank you. Thanks. What will happen to the installation after nine months? Are you going to bring it down? Where are the materials going to go? Uh, we'll probably pick up the shimmer panels, which are the where the pattern resides. And I'll bring that back to New Zealand so I can show it at another time. The structure itself will be recycled. Like, we're really careful about, um, you know, it's, it's quite strange for me working with a material that's got a lot of plastic in it. So for me, it, it behoves me to use it as much as possible and not be um, wasteful with it. Um, also, it might be an opportunity to work with I don't know, I might work with some students and we can play with it and make new patterns out of it. Um, but yes, after nine months, we'll be, we'll be, some of it will return, will come to New Zealand and the rest will be recycled locally. Yeah. So Lisa is part of a collective called Pacific Sisters. And um, maybe Lisa, you want to talk about like what 
Yeah. You know, you do. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, for the closing uh, of this work, we're going to do a final performance. It's called a pora poraaki um, in Māori gym, and that's where we say goodbye to something. And uh, there's a number of the Pacific Sisters group are going to come here. We're going to do a workshop and make some costumes, and we'll do a performance uh, within the building and on the rooftop itself. So we'd like to work with some local people as well. Um, so watch this space. It'd be nice to invite some local people to take part in that. We've got some extra um, sequins, and we'll use those to make something fabulous and shimmery and... We'll just shimmy ourselves around the rooftop, I think. And yeah. I'll sing, and there'll be some music. And I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet, but that's something that will be really nice to return after it's had its time here. The Pacific Sisters is a collective of um, Samoans, Maori, Pacific Islander, uh, fashion activists, designers, um, musicians, artists, which include Lisa Rahana. And they are known for, uh, they are known for, uh, they were founded, they were formed in the 1990s. I remember something about you or getting together during the clubbing scene, hanging out as girlfriends. <laughs> yes. and, and then um, known for like reusing materials to create costumes and body adornments to actually raise the visibility of Pacific Islander um, culture. They recently exhibited as part of the last Sydney Biennale that just closed, I think, last week. Yes. Yeah. So keep, keep your eye out for yes. this. <laughs> Come along. To Dr. Robert. Thank you. Uh, I saw a short video as to how you assembled Gliston. It's like it came in square panels, right? Yeah. Uh, and then it's also very intricate because each disc is like having to be affixed. So where were all this made? Is it in Singapore or another country and you brought it in? Yeah, I worked with a company in China and we had the pattern, um, the shimmer panels, there's a hundred on each panel. They were assembled in China and then freighted here. And then we worked with another company, a local company in Singapore, uh, Pico Art, and they built uh, the frame. Uh, I worked with an architect in Sydney who designed the frame. Um, we also worked with uh, my partner James, a really dear friend of his, Gary Hunt, and we worked on making the um, wind chime. So it was a really international effort to bring this um, project together. I also wanted to make something that if I couldn't have come here, like if there was for some reason that I couldn't turn up and be on the shores, it would still be able to be delivered. So, you know, it's very um, tricky these current days and the cost of freighting and all those kind of aspects. So um, more and more I think about projects that might not, might not have to have me be um, attending, not that I don't mind being here, <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it could could be um, set up again uh, without me. You know, but it's all been really well thought out and thought through before we arrived. Each of the frame is about ten sequins across and ten below, so it's a hundred. It's about thirty cm by thirty cm, but we had to carefully align them so that they would match. Should one even like go astray, it would just mean that the pattern would have been compromised. Sorry? Sequence. Yeah, yeah about that. Yeah. yeah. It's very mathematical. But it's, it's very much aligned with how um, master weavers think. There's this notion called ethnomathematics, and it's the way that weavers can look at a pattern and almost reverse engineer it and work out how to lay out a pattern. And that's, a, and, and that's something that I've learned you know, in, in my many years of working on computers and making imagery, as you, you, you get to sort of look at something and sort of understand how it's put together. And in that way, I really was trying to, 
I mean, 114,000 um, pixels is not very much because if you look at a garment, you know, there's so, you know, there's so many. It's, it's even like when you uh, buy sheets, like a 500 um, per, per yeah, 500 three, three count. count per inch. So you can see, like, I, I in some ways, I almost needed more, more pixels. The more pixels you have, the more complicated a pattern can look. Um, so that was my, um, my job was to create something that felt very cohesive. Um, what I learned from studying the song kit is to try and achieve a sense of balance and harmony. And in a way, it's a detail of a song kit, the hedge and some of the pattern. There almost wasn't enough pixels for me to, to do more. So now I feel very excited to make some more using this material because I can see it looks pretty good. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's once you done one, I can see why weavers go, oh, you quickly have to finish something so you can start something anew. Um, there's a philosophy um, in Maori weaving. The first thing that you make, you have to give away. And the reason you do that is you give it away so that you have to make something again. Yeah, so it just keeps you practicing and, and through that process, you get better and better and better at what you do, but you also, your work travels because other people are carrying it and, it, and that's part of the, 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 the joy of making is seeing it move in the world and being used in the world. We probably have time for one more last question before we go around. Hi, so I hear that there are many pieces involved in the assembly, so I'm just curious how long it took to set up the whole um, exhibition piece and uh, whether the weather gave you any challenges because we know it has been raining quite heavily for the past few days. I think probably by and large it was set up over two weeks once we um, assembled all the various materials and once we settled on the design. Um, the whole process has really taken about six months, six or seven months. Six months and then a bit of tweak on design in after April and then towards May with like full production. We started installing in the, in the midst of the crazy heat wave last month. I don't know if yeah. everybody remember that. <laughs> that was hot. good fun. <laughs> Um, I think the biggest challenge we had was getting the wind chime to work because it's at this, it's so protected in that area. So uh, I think I restrung it about three different times and remade it um, just to get it to have that little tinkly glisten in there. So listen out. Yes, well, I think we should probably, if, if anyone would like to join us, we're going to just take a little walk together up onto the rooftop garden. You don't normally get to be up there at this, at this late in the evening because it gets closed off at 7 p.m. But if yeah. anyone would like to join us, we'll go for a walk. And also, just a note, Glisten is actually made out of five colours. So, like, if you want to have a look and spot which five colours they are, please go ahead. It is kind of interesting to see like how the colors are moderated, like you know, in the background and the complexity of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.